The Stack. People, business, technology. With Dan Tomaszewski of Everything MSP. Hello, everybody. Dan Tomaszewski here. Hope you're doing well and having a great day. Uh, today, we are going to dive deep into the world of governance and compliance. It's a topic that's becoming increasingly critical for MSPs in today's evolving regulatory landscape. Cyber insurance claims are getting denied. Client-facing growing risks, uh, security risks are out there. It's time for us to take that proactive approach to governance. And joining us today, I've got Brian Doyle, who is the co-founder of VCIO Toolbox, who's going to share some experience with us on how MSPs can not only navigate these challenges, but turn them into opportunities for growth. So let's go ahead and bring Brian in. How are you doing today, Brian? Great, Dan. Always fun to hang out with you. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here, and I always love uh, talking about the uh, you know the never-ending challenge of cybersecurity, governance, compliance. Um, it, you know, it's not going away, is it? No, if anything, things are getting you know to a point where we really need to harness it more, right? You know, as yeah. we were talking about, these threats are getting so involved, but now the oversight component's becoming so important. So we're hoping to be able to do that. And, you know, and today we're going to talk about uh, building a profitable governance practice, um, strengthening client relationships and positioning an MSP to be a trusted advisor. And, you know, really the word trusted advisor kind of, uh, I mean, it's so, so overused. And I, I would rather that word be trusted authority. And because I think there's a huge difference there. Um, I, you know, I think when you take a look at a trusted advisor, that person is more prioritizing the relationship and in providing some personal guidance. But as a trusted authority, you are emphasizing ultimately the recognized expertise in industry leadership. And, uh, and of course, none of this happens overnight um, and none of it happens without any kind of continuous education, right? No, and you're spot on with that. I mean, even as we've been evolving VCIO toolbox, we had to wait a little bit for the market to get to a certain maturity before we could even introduce our compliance piece. You know, we had we most of us folks know to us as QBR guys, right? And coming to the market right. that way. But um, we had always planned on building a unified advisory platform, mer merging those two worlds. And now the market's really calling for it. You know, the challenges in cyber insurability, ensuring that we're not getting carve outs, you know, when claims are paid or getting our claims rejected altogether have actually probably taken more precedence over some of the true regulatory concerns out there. And, you know, that's a little place in the world that we're trying to help. Yeah. And I, I think too, it really is, um, you know, elevating what the QBR is or technology business review, whatever the case may be. But, you know, a lot of conversations occur around that MSPs are becoming more of a commodity. And I think this elevation, this area of focus, um, you know, bringing this new life to a QBR is what differentiates you from any other MSP. Yeah, I think, you know, we've always come from a business first perspective in all of our conversations that we build through the platform. You know, we've taken into account who the end user customer is and what they need to see. And what they need to see is outcomes, right? That That's how they right. make the decisions on what they want to do. And what they don't want is a all about me brag fest from the MSP yeah. followed up with a list of products that they need to buy. But, um, you know, what we've really tried to shape over time is really helping drive value for the MSP and exactly what you said, elevate their perception, make sure they're being looked at as a true partner that's bringing technology leadership and that authority and expertise to the table and doing it in a way that helps them better manage things like risk. And, and when we have these conversations with our clients, we truly want to be working with a leadership team. You know, we don't want to, you know, be uh, handed over to maybe an office manager uh, within the organization. And, we, you know, maybe in some organizations that is the appropriate person, um, but we want truly to be in front of the leadership team. And, you know, we can maybe do that once, but if we don't you know, have a quality uh, meeting with them. If we're not, you know, providing true value during that meeting with them, we won't get a chance to have a second meeting with that leadership team. 
Yeah, I mean, you've, you're hitting it spot on. I mean, first and foremost, one of the biggest areas that MSPs have vulnerability with their clients is when they're only positioned with a single point of contact, that office manager, that middle manager, and they're not building relationships with these C-level people. Because as you know, in the world of MSP, the better we do, often the more questions that come up, the more we automate, the more we do remotely, the less we're on site and less things break. And those key right. stages if they're not directly involved, they're going to question the bill. And that's where we see yeah. that, that challenge. So how do we elevate? It, it's very simple. Bring things of value that are going to keep the C-level coming back to any of your meetings. And really the two areas, you know, people only buy things for three reasons, Dan, to make money, to save money, or to manage risk. And if we can show them how they can manage risk, the byproduct usually is saving money and making money in other areas. And that's going to guide them to better decision-making, more comfortable and confident decision-making and elevate your perception with the client. So taking, uh, taking that to the next level, what are some things that an MSP should be doing um, if they truly want to build and deliver a VCSO and governance service? So let's break this down into a couple different parts, right? And let's start first with the MSP landscape. We're seeing a change, right? Break fix has obviously been dwindling as, as you know, areas that we can build into. Um, most of the cloud journey shifted during the COVID era where we were finally able to get those customers that were lagging behind, in, you know, up into the cloud. And now the hybrid environments that they have, if they exist, are very tailored for their specific need. So what is an MSP going to do as we move forward? And you've certainly seen that security has been a big part of that conversation as the technologies have, or as these uh, MSPs have evolved into MSSPs, building the security stack. But now they need to look and shift to what the customer wants too. They don't want to just know where there might be a gap in their environment. They want to quantify that gap. What's the likelihood right. of it happening? What's going to be the impact to our business if that does happen? And how are we going to manage that? We can't sell on fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We have to sell on actual conditions within the MSP, I mean, within the client environment. And there's a huge opportunity for the MSPs to do that. And then you pull all the other consulting things around it. AI conversations, application conversations. We really need to take a bigger place on the things that we didn't once own in the past, like line of business apps. Yeah, and you, you know, you mentioned uh, FUD, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I think it's important that we address, you know, what the the real world ramifications are out there. But like you said, if we're only focused on that, um, I, I think it becomes a turnoff because I think people do recognize when someone's trying to just truly sell them something and not, you know, they're not genuine about wanting to help them. And the funny part is there's such an easy transition on that too, right? I'm selling to you, Dan, and I'm telling you that as a small business, even though you're not targeted, there might be the ability, you know, there's the ability for bots to go out there and drop that ransomware packet. And if they can get into you or, you know, send that phishing email or whatever the case may be to get into your environment. But those are all might haves, right? Or could happens. And some people just don't want to hear it because they've heard it for so long and every conversation with you and every commercial they've seen on TV around technology. Right. But now pivot that. Hey, we've identified these gaps through the analysis that we've done, you know, to this framework, you know, security framework, you know, your NIST, your HIPAAs, those kind of things, as well as looking at your infrastructure. I share these gaps with you so you have them in your back pocket and you know them. So when you're dealing with your investors and your board of directors and your key clients, you're not qual. Uh, you know, caught flat footed. And oh, by the yeah. way, we have a plan to remediate. I don't know where that is in your process, but we can close the gap on those risks. We might not eliminate them. There'll be, you know, risk that lives after you make some of the corrections as well, but we can certainly mitigate, you know, mitigate that risk. Now it's all about them. It's not about fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it's about yeah. things that they can measure. And it's a much more business focused conversation that does put you in the seat of an authority, right? Absolutely. And it needs to be that smooth transition ultimately. And uh, so when you take a look at um, the core components for a VCCO or a government, uh, I'm sorry, governance as a service program, you know, what does that look like? 
So, you know, whether you're, you want to call it governance as a service, VC, so as a service, there's really some services that wrap around your stack that have to be done, right? So first and foremost, you're the leader of policy and procedure. Those policies and procedures that your company may have drafted up have to be looked at routinely and regularly, but they often aren't, right? Talk to your customers and ask them when was the last time that policy that's in their handbook was looked at? And you might hear, you know, when the policy, when the handbook was written, right? But if you look at most regulatory frameworks, they're telling you that they need to be reviewed at least on an annual basis. Right. Now, the cu- what we really see is the customer is not equipped internally to know, is this policy really adhering to the letter of the law that I might have to adhere to outside, you know, my four walls? Or is this going to be a problem when I get analyzed for cyber insurance and I need a claim to get paid. So, you know, this is a perfect example of where we can step up and really be, you know, supportive to our customers by helping them craft the right policies that have the right teeth. We're not lawyers, right? But we know what the technical ramifications are and get them to the point where now they might have a policy that just needs to be reviewed by legal rather than created by legal, saving them a lot of money in the process. So there's definitely that policy and procedure edge. Then there's the tool layer, right? You're building your MSP stacks and obviously you're building best of breed products to, you know, handle that security conversation. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be the right products forever. So if VC so also has to do an annual review of the products that they're using to make sure that they're giving the information to adhere to that, while also making sure that the evidence that they would need for a program like continuous security monitoring, security and awareness training artifacts, pen testing. Those things are happening as well as part of this process. And then, you know, finally, it's risk management, right? And and if you really want to start talking at a business level with your customers, simply identify the gaps and turn that into a risk that you can measure. What I mean by that is looking at the impact to the business and the likelihood of it happening. If you don't have cyber insurance and you get breached, that's going to be a very high impact, right? That's going to be a five on a scale of one to five. Right. And the likelihood of that happening might be low, might be a one or two for a small to mid-sized business, but that makes it a medium-sized risk if you use a traditional risk management measurement process. That's huge to a business. They don't know that. They don't understand that part. And that's where we can share that with them and then guide them to making the decision about go or no go without us having to sell at all. We're really helping them draw conclusions. Yeah, and I think you know business uh, business owners, business leaders understand you know that we must change and adapt to the, the you know the changing landscape. Um, just I mean they 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 get that just from a perspective of their business. If they don't change, if they become complacent in their business, um, complacency kills, and you know right. it kills a business. But even more so on the cybersecurity side, that complacency is, uh, you know, is a, is a death trap for a business. And break it down a little bit differently. I'm sure their finance teams or finance director or CFO is looking at financial risk on the daily for them. You know, stress testing where they stand from a cash flow perspective, looking at what the future forecast is and really playing out worst case scenarios for the company. You know, if X were to happen, you know, largest customer leave, something like that, right? Similarly, if you look at a chief operating officer, and let's pretend for a minute this is a manufacturing company, they're looking at supply chain concerns. Can they get the raw goods that they need to bring in? And what's the risk if they can't get them? And what's the risk if that cost goes up by 3% to, to their end right. users? Then their systems. You know, we all know there's some CNC machines out there that still in this day and age can't run on anything past Windows 7. Yeah. You know, what happens if those machines just fail outright and we can't get them back up to speed? You know, what is the risk that we're operating on to deliver our goods in a timely fashion to our customers? We're really having that need to have that same conversation from a technology standpoint. It's no longer, hey, your machines are getting old and you can be vulnerable because they're not going to be supported anymore. Or if you don't move to this kind of thing, you know, this new tool, you're going to be, you know, left behind. Now it's really looking at, hey, your biggest threat are your internal teams. Are you getting them the right training? Your other biggest threat is not knowing where, you know, what your risk posture is and where that risk can potentially bite you first. You know, where, where's the highest yeah. likelihood risks, especially in elemental impact. And the thing is, they understand that very easily because they are having that discussion, as we just illustrated, at the finance side, at the operational side. Now we're just bringing the cyber side underneath the, the umbrella. 
Earlier, uh, you mentioned frameworks. And when you take a look at framework assessments, is it uh, ultimately a once a year type of event? <sighs> You know, a lot of people want to do a once a year event, and that's what you're getting from a reporting standpoint, right? I have to report usually at least once annually for certain regulatory compliance requirements that I have. But, you know, we come from the school that you should iterate as improvement is made. And the DOD kind of forces this, you know, the NIST 800-171, which now will be CMMC as of uh, we're recording on the 14th, on the 15th it will be. But, yep. you know, obviously there's going to be a, a period of time to be able to grow into that for you. But the point in all this is those expectations have always been on the DOD side. As you make updates to your plan of action and improve, you're going to update your SPRS score, which is doing your assessment to generate that, and report that in with your system security plan. And that iteration, I think, is key, and it's a huge opportunity for the MSP. If you can show even quarterly updates, the worst is the first when it comes to an assessment. Maintaining it yeah. becomes much easier. If you can show a customer a quarterly compliance roadmap and show where improvements been made and where eventually regression is going to happen because it's technology, things change, that's going to be a very compelling story to keeping things very active throughout the year. And it's going to make next year's burden to getting certified a ton easier. Sure. And, you know, I think too, um, you know, do you want your security service provider to be just doing the bare minimum or do you want them to go up and above? Right. I mean, there, there I think there is a point where you can go, you know, beyond expectations yeah. and it, it is not going to provide a, a lot of value, but there's certainly you know, value that can be provided by going up and above what the bare minimum is. And again, if you come at it from this concept of looking at it from a risk lens, it's really, hey, I want to continue to, you know, I certainly want to showcase to the customer where we're improving risk posture, but as new risks come in, I don't want that to be an annual event because we might get bit by that risk before we even analyze it again if we're, we're doing it once yeah. a year. Now, not all things are equal policies for the most part, most frameworks are asking you for annual reviews reviews on the policies that are supporting your activities, because those aren't things that are going to change as much. And they're more for legal perspective and user behavior than they are for, you know, risk that you have to fight against. Yeah. And speaking of risk, um, how should this risk be presented to the client? So, you know, I, there are standard risk models out in the marketplace. And candidly, you know, we, we followed traditional risk models you'll see in the world of NIST, you'll see in the world of ISO as well. It's really a heat map format. So when you're identifying the risks, you know, in most cases, you're going to determine what's my inherent risk is it high, medium or low, you know, what's going to be my residual risk after I even solve this problem, because unless you turn the lights out and unplug the system, there's still risk that's going to be involved. Right. But then really what we're doing is measuring impact and probability. And that is unique to the customer and what the customer does. You know, the, the same risk might not have the same impact or likelihood to a business based on, you know, two businesses that are similar based on how they're architected, how they operate and what that that means to their critical application supporting. So the art form is really being able to determine that, that impact and likelihood. Then it becomes a really simple scoring model. Impact times likelihood e equals a risk score. And that risk score then gets plotted to a heat map. And heat maps are, you know, think about your customers. They can see and understand things when they're visual. So it's really easy yeah. to look at a heat map that goes from, you know, right to left with the bottom left quadrant being green and saying to your customer, we want to get as much of our risk as close to the bottom left as we possibly can. And as you can see, your risk seems to lean more towards the top right in many areas. And here, here's what those biggest ones are. Now, I wish we had a visual for this right here so that the listener could hear it. But the reality yeah. is, you know, it's really built into four bands, critical, high, medium and low risk, right? And obviously you want as much as you can down in that medium and low risk area. And I think those visuals are critical. I mean, we, we're talking about a complex area of, um, you know, when we take a look at cybersecurity, um, we, we certainly aren't going to expect that all of our um, clients, leadership teams and so on are going to completely understand what we're talking about. That's why they're paying us to help manage this for them. But I think we, we do need to help them to understand it, you know, conceptually. And I think those visuals do help lay it out. And it makes it easier for them to, you know, um, accept it, 
Um, and you know, they, they have to take that ownership of it and that's how we get them to that point. So. And there's a, really a win for the MSP in this process too. You're also tracking the risk they accept. There are plenty of times the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? Hey, we right. have a relatively low risk. It's low impact, low likelihood, but it's got high cost. And we don't think the, you know, me, the company now doesn't think that there's enough value to, for me to spend those dollars here. Well, we need to track when that risk is formally accepted by the client because the liability is really transitioning to them at that point to help cover our needs as an MSP. Should something go wrong a year from now and your customer has a short memory, they forget you right. positioned it with them. And now their insurance company is coming after you because why wouldn't they, right? To, to hopefully get the claim paid yeah. elsewhere. So, you know, there's a little bit of covering your own here, but also educating the customer in the process. You know, hey, you are going to accept some risks. We need to know what they are and make sure that we're accepting the right ones logically. Absolutely. And, and Brian, as we're wrapping things up here, um, you know, you, you've provided uh, an incredible amount of information for our audience today. And, um, you know, you have this passion for this segment of the business, uh, VCIO Toolbox is an organization that helps MSPs um, in this area. Can you give us a little bit more background about um, you know, a newer offering that you have available yeah. and how this helps MSPs? So you know, for many of our clients, you might be familiar with the fact that we had a governance risk and compliance system in there. It was you know, basically the extension of our QBR efforts, allowing you to do framework assessments. But over the last you know, six to 12 months, we've really been building, been building it so it could be a standalone CISO platform for, you know, the chief information security officer, the MSP that's taking on that role and responsibilities. So in addition to framework assessments, which certainly play a large part in a good, you know, a good governance program, the reality is there are things that sit outside the frameworks as well. Not all frameworks address simple things fire, flood, ge geographical concerns. They're not looking at cyber insurability in most cases. They're supporting cyber insurability, but they're not asking point blank, do we have it? So we have extended our risk manager to be able to centralize things that come from the framework, as well as bringing in those third-party risks and sharing that risk story. Then we go, then we go beyond that. We've got third-party risk management where you can take on the responsibility of managing the vendors that your customer is working with. You can have both a, a set of global vendors you can attach to all clients, and then you can be sending out the due diligence assessments that you've been the receiver of as an MSP on behalf of your client to help them make third-party risk decisions. And then finally, we have policy management and advanced policy manager coming into the system in our November release just before, um, well, actually, when we're announcing this new platform, which is called the Cyberance Compliance Platform. And in that, you're going to have policies that you can edit um, you know, that'll bring in your customer information. You can edit and tailor them to your customer's unique need. And then you can send it out for workflow approval, signature, track signature compliance. So you have the evidence you need for audit capabilities and then get annual reminders that it's time to relook and revisit these policies. So you stay within the compliance requirements on that as well. So these tools together really allow an MSP to build that overarching consulting service help their clients with whatever their requirement is there. But then we take all that information and we have program dashboards so you can look at your entire portfolio sim simply, manage your third party simply, and really uh, you know, track this evidence and share this evidence as required with auditors without you know, going through it many hoops. And the best part is we connect with the tools you use. You're not forced to any particular nice. scanner. You know, our integrations and the things we've done on the, v, you know, the QBR side really extend out to the GRC side as well. And we automate a lot of the evidence collection that's required in that platform. That's excellent. And you guys have a special offer for our audience? Yeah, we've got a, a number of different things. So, you know, if you're down at IT Nation, we're going to have some show offerings. But what I can tell you is uh, the first two months of the Advanced Policy Manager, as an example, that will be 50% off of retail price for those that are early adopters. And uh, we are going to be putting together a special bundle price. Unfortunately, Dan, I don't have the price as we're recording this a couple of weeks before release. Yeah. But we will be have a very special uh, bundled offering for those that are new to the compliance game, where the three core components, which is, you know, framework and risk, third party risk management and policy management, that bundle will be given at a 25% discount to all new users at that stage as well. 
Excellent. And of course, our audience can learn more about VCIO Toolbox at VCIOtoolbox.com. Um, also, scrolling across your screen at the bottom, uh, if you are on the everythingmsp.com website, you can search for VCIO Toolbox and learn more there. You can schedule um, a demo. You can reach out to them directly as well. Uh, Brian, I want to thank you so much for your information. I always love having conversations with you and uh, really appreciate your time. No, Dan, really appreciate it as well. Thank you for all you do for the community. It's great to have voices like yours bringing people out and helping educate. And, uh, you know, I get excited every Wednesday to jump in on WTF. <laughs> I appreciate that. Love it. All right, everybody. Thank you for uh, your time. Until next time, we will talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to The Stack.